Uh, let's all pray at this time. Father in heaven, this evening we gather in your presence, understanding how great thou art, understanding your great love for each one of us. We're thankful for this opportunity to study your words. To remind ourselves that these are indeed the closing years of Earth's history. And we can die at any moment. So today we choose to make our calling and our election sure. We have touched the surface of these critical issues in the past. May we take it one step deeper. Reveal to us the truth for these last days. And as we go into our Bible questions and answers, prepare us to stand for you in these last days. May we as parents prepare our children, prepare ourselves. We do not know the day nor the hour. So today we choose Jesus. Bless us now for these few moments. Send the Holy Spirit, send the holy angels to minister unto us. Dear Jesus, we love you. May we be in that number, meeting you in the air when you return. And may we hear the words from thy lips, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over much. Bless us now, we pray, in the name of Jesus. Amen. We want to get right into our lesson for today. As we prepare for this question and answer segment, and before we, before we get into that, we're also going to be addressing the current event I touched on this afternoon in the midday message, and then we're going to hasten our footsteps and get into our Bible Q&A. Now, take a look at this here, friends. When you understand uh, the issue in the great controversy between Christ and Satan, and that issue is over worship, and true worship leads a person to the experience of freedom. As 2 Corinthians chapter 3 says, uh, that where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Are you aware of that scripture? 2 Corinthians 3, verse 17 and verse 18. But what is Satan's plan? Well, Isaiah chapter 14 and verse 12 through verse 17 it is Satan's plan to enslave mankind, enslave mankind. And today I want to connect Agenda 21 with Agenda 2030. And uh, the point I'm trying to emphasize, and I will emphasize by God's grace, is that the so-called policies that they are now rolling out in 2024 to us, we might have believed that these are something modern, that these policies were recently thought of and are now being executed. Not so when you consider Agenda 21, that these policies were already put in place decades ago. And this is what makes them culprits and tyrants. As I always say, that this so-called modern fad, fashion, and uh, smart devices, smart homes, uh, all these modern day technological conveniences, as I've said, one more time I'll say it, 
it will lead to the death of our liberties. Conveniences will lead to the death of liberties. Mark my words. Welcome to 2030, the policies of Agenda 2030. You own nothing, you'll be slaves, they own everything. You don't own appliances. Don't forget that, I'll come back to that. You own no house, you don't own a car. You don't even own clothes. Agenda 2030. Now, we are approximately six years to Agenda 2030, the actual year, 2030. When you look at Agenda 21, which many have said should have come to fruition in the year 2021, that means we are on protracted probation. Their agenda was not accomplished fully by 2021. What do you think they're going to do between now and 2030? They are going to put the proverbial vehicle into overdrive. And that's why last year they came out on several news media outlets stating that 2023 is year one of the new world order. How this year is a year for acceleration to 2030. They are already in overdrive while God's people are crawling like snails. Jeremiah 12, if you cannot run with the footmen, how are you going to endure when the horses come? And by God's grace, I'm going to be addressing the horses. Let's read that. Jeremiah chapter 12. Go there with me. Yeah, I like that. Yes. Crawling. Crawling on all fours. Look at Jeremiah 12, look at verse 5. If thou hast run with the footmen and they have wearied thee, then how canst thou contend with the what? The horses. And if in the land of peace wherein thou trusteth, they weary thee, then how wilt thou do in the swelling of the Jordan? What moves faster, footmen or horses? So in the last days, things are not going to go slower. They go how? Faster. What moves faster? Tell me. Horses or the swelling of Jordan? Water, billowing waters, rushing fast. Have, have you ever tried to outrun a sun, uh, waves? How far do you get? So the closer we come to the end, things get rapid. As Sister White says in volume 9, page 11, that final movement shall be what? Rapid, rapid ones. And the swelling of Jordan, take your instrument of writing. The swelling of Jordan, put down Jeremiah 50, verse 44 through verse 46. The swelling of Jordan is connected to Babylon coming. Literal ancient Babylon in the days of Jeremiah to enslave to enslave unrepentant Jews. The destruction of Solomon's temple, the sweating of Jordan, Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, to destroy Jerusalem. Remove, watch this, my friends. Removing, it's all connected. Removing the Hebrews from Jerusalem, from Judea, and brought them into where? Babylon. And the current events I'm going to address, they're now telling us in Agenda 2021, Agenda 21, move the people from the country to where? To the cities. What a connection. Horsemen. Then comes the swelling of Jordan. And God's people aren't even footmen now. Do you know where we are? We're not, we are not at the footman stage. We're actually between the horses and the swelling of Jordan. That's where we are. Cut that. Watch this. I'll come back to this. Let me move. Okay, here it is. Genesis chapter 47, Bible. It says uh, they moved the people from the country into the cities. But Joseph's family remained where? In Goshen, in the country where they could rear their cattle and farm the land. All right, that's Bible, my friends. 
Bible, pastors. And of course, they sold their salvation. I covered that this morning. It's all there. Listen now, Agenda 21. Recall we mentioned the United Nations Habitat One plan that came down at the Vancouver Convention in 1976. Under this plan, all humans that once lived on farms and in rural areas, so-called wildlands, will be relocated to cities, now referred to as human settlements. All right, let's read that now. This is the actual document. Habitat One was the first UN conference on human settlements. It took place, okay, we get that. Next sentence. The UN General Assembly convened the Habitat One conference as governments began to recognize the need for what now? S huh? Sustainable human settlements and the consequences of what? Rapid urbanization. And we thought this slogan, sustainable development, was recently conjured up. No, 1976. Now, they say there's a consequence for rapid what? May I ask you a question? Could this be the reason for them having open borders? Think about it. So more folks come in, and now they have to what now? Put everybody in tenements, cages, as it were. Watch this, continue. As a result of this conference, the Vancouver Declaration of Human Settlements came into being and made history by providing the first definition of adequate shelter and recommendations for each what? Is, is the United States of America a part of the UN? What about Canada? Ella Buchanan. Huh? All right. Next paragraph. Of special import. Watch this. Of special importance is the elimination. The what? The elimination of social and racial segregation. Among other things. Through the creation of better balanced communities which blend different social groups, occupation, housing, and amenities. In other words, they are going to put everybody together. But not themselves, though. No, no. They will dwell somewhere else. Put everybody in the same place. Do you know where they do this? In prisons. Literal jail houses. All right? And what are we to watch now? Because some might think that's, that sounds... Uh, uh, Prejudicial. In the book Adventist Home, page 141, we're told to move out into the countries where the houses, the homes, are not crowded, closely together, and where we'll be free from the interference of enemies. Do you see how this agenda does not jive with God's agenda? Let's continue. It says here, it is, our uh, red words, you inhabit now promote socially and environmentally sustainable towns and cities. Sustainable development. It is a focal point of all urbanization and human settlement matters within the UN system. You inhabit envisions well-planned, well-governed, and efficient what? Cities, you mean smart cities? And are the human settlements with adequate housing, adequate infrastructure, and what? Universal access to what? So what do they plan to do to the economy? My, these are code words for pauperism. Adequate infrastructure, universal access to employment, and basic services such as water, energy, and what? Sanitation. That word sanitation. Do you remember the video I played last Sabbath, Songbird, where the young lady was in her apartment complex on lockdown, curfew, uh, martial law, and she said, my next door neighbor, has now the, 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 the virus, 
when the, when the officers, well, when the authorities came and knocked on the door next door, what did they say? Sanitation. Sanitation removes garbage and trash. So who are we to them? Rubbish. Garbage. You think it's a joke. Watch this. And uh, the idea is that if you concentrate populations into specific areas or zones, less energy usage, less water usage, and less transportation. So people will uh, have less reason to leave home. They'll uh, stay in their homes. They may even work out of their homes. And uh, so they're not going to be using uh, their cars. They're not going to be. What stood out to you here? What now? Depression. You can't move. All right, what else? Inmates in a prison, what else? Lockdown, what else? Car free, what else? What now? Stay home orders. Now, is there not a movement to combat climate change? They're telling us what the solution is going to be. Less water. Less electricity. Oh, we can care for the climate. That's the end goal. And when was this rolled out? 19 what? 76. 86. 96. 06. 16. Almost, almost 50 years ago. Life from where you shop to where you work, all within a 15-minute walk. What now? Sounds pretty nice, right? Cities around the country are already doing it. And... And the persons who are ignorant of what we're talking about would think 15-minute cities is something newly conceptualized. Is that the case? 1976. As more Americans work from home, they are changing the way they live, seeking more social, walkable communities. But are they willing to give up their cars entirely? One real estate developer is making a bet that in Tempe, Arizona, they will. That's where we find CNBC senior real estate correspondent Diana Olick. Hi, Diana. Hey, Contessa. Yeah, this new $170 million rental community has all the amenities, the fitness center, the dog park, the outdoor kitchens. Well, what it does not have is cars. Cul-de-sac is the first community in the U.S. designed specifically for car-free living. Co and how many young people would be a part of that? Because they can't afford cost of living. People are happier in their car-free cities. Happier, listen. This brand new rental community in Tempe has all the amenities, fitness center, dog park, outdoor kitchens, but something's missing. So there are no cars in this community at all. Isn't it great? <laughs> Slavery is great. Part of the community, first floor studios are rented to small businesses and some of the business owners act. Everything in the same place, no Eyes. time for this. Everything in the same place, give me this one. Instead, we the people instead we the people will live in apartments and condos in mega cities near railroad tracks near what why is that in the script here it is now friends car free city tempe arizona now retail restaurants and close to 200 apartments in the first phase no cars means no parking no garages no parking spaces so more space for social areas the complex is strategically located right next to the area's light rail system all residents get a free pass the first two hold on no cars because cars emit carbon monoxide right right but we can have trains We can't have trains, though. And who's behind Agenda 21 and Agenda 2030? The WEF Klaus Schwab? Why next to train stations? Holocaust? Professor Klaus Schwab was born in 1938 in Ravensburg, Germany, where Nazi crimes against humanity were committed. His father, Eugene Wilhelm Schwab, was the managing director of Escher Weiss Ravensburg, a company that used slave labor to manufacture weapons of war for the Third Reich. While Klaus's father was at the helm, the Nazi party awarded Escher Weiss Ravensburg the title of National Socialist Model Company. 
He said, this has to be put in the script so people can see who the underboss is. Years later, Klaus Schwab joined the board of directors at Escher Weiss Ravensburg, where he played a key role in the development of South Africa's nuclear weapons program during the darkest years of the racist apartheid regime. Today, Klaus Schwab is the founder and executive chairman of the World Economic Forum. Watch this, listen. While the animals run wild in continental corridors, we the humans will live in transit villages and smart cities. Smart growth or a new urbanism uh, is that... Uh, we thought the idea of smart cities is something new, right? 1976, Agenda 21. Listen again. While the animals run wild in continental corridors, we the humans will live in transit villages and smart cities. Smart growth or a new urbanism uh, is that ideology that says that you shouldn't have more space than you actually need. So if you're a couple of people living in a three bedroom house, well, you don't need that extra space. So why do you have it? How many, how many children who had moved out of mom and pop's home had to return home during the pandemic. So they create crises, destroy the economy, you can't afford cost of living, and now you have to buy the idea, buy into it, that listen, settle for less. Is tiny home really tiny? Is the money tiny? If they can put a thousand people in one building, it's a whole lot easier to know what they're doing, where they're going, and how they're thinking than it is if you've got a thousand people living in a rural or suburban area. And so the stack and pack is multi-story buildings, multiple families living in the same spot, walking in and out of the same door, always being able to be managed. What? Come on, what stood out to you? St stack and pack, as if we're animals, right? Have you ever seen those trucks and trailers on the highways with the cattle stacked and packed? Chickens stacked and packed? I mean, all they must do next is tag us. What else stood out to you? Surveillance. Surveillance. Slavery. But they call it what? Smart cities? And how many young and older folks are going to say, oh, you're too archaic, you're too old-fashioned, come live over here, smart city. Living in a smart city, but you are a dumb human being. Who the cap fit? Wear it. They're designing these new little mini cities that they call districts where your building is going to have 500 or 600 units for living, then it's going to have office space, then it's going to have retail, all in the same building. Meanwhile, it's only going to have a few parking spaces. They're literally putting huge signs in the streets, and they all look exactly the same, and it says City of Toronto rezoning, and they are all identical, and it has residences on top, office buildings and retail in the middle and the bottom, and then almost no infrastructure for parking. So there's not enough, there's not even enough parking for the people living there. You're supposed to live upstairs, work somewhere in the building, go to the gym or your Starbucks or your grocery store, everything in the building. So basically, you're living on lockdown your entire life, just like they wanted you to do with COVID. Remember with COVID when you were on lockdown and they said you couldn't go more than five kilometers away from your house? Well, if you don't have a car, guess what? You're never going to go more than five yeah. kilometers away from that's Toronto. I was speaking with Elder Buchanan this week again on the same point. And the point that was raised is that Canada, in some respects, are further along, is further along to implementing the mark of the beast policies. Not the Sunder law first. That's in America. In America, they'll tell you simply, listen, we are going to shut you down for misinformation, disinformation. In Canada, it's life imprisonment. 
for misinformation, disinformation. Who is more draconian right now? That's what we are made to think. Slavery. This is in Toronto, and I've shared various clips. It's going on now in America. Well, 50 a 15-minute city mean basically a neighborhood where you can reach everything you need within a 15-minute foot walk a doctor a grocery store and so forth however if you now fancy another store and it does not happen to be in your neighborhood you won't be going to that store anymore total control is what we're talking about once they decide you're no longer allowed to leave your 15-minute immediate area they don't have to fence it in or anything it will be done via digital id with the social credit system kind something of friends think about this if you all live in the same building, everybody knows who you are. What about informers and people that are going to snitch on you, betray you as Judas Iscariot betrayed Jesus because he knew where Christ frequented? In the same building. That's monitoring, surveillance. Catherine Fitz, by now I should be rich. Um, I think... It's very hard for people who've grown up and enjoyed Western liberty and, and human liberty to imagine literally that we're going into a system where literally our homes, our cars, our communities become digital concentration camps. Yeah. And we're thinking again, this thing is recent, been on the books for years. What about shock collars? And smart meters play a big role in that management as uh, they can measure everything. What are they now rolling out? Smart meters for your smart homes, smart appliances. And smart meters play a big role in that management as uh, they can measure everything uh, that you do in your life when you're using smart appliances if you know someone told my wife and i i'm not sure if hillary recalls this anybody here has a smart refrigerator raise your hand let me see and we were told and shown that this person can actually monitor what's in the refrigerator from what their smartphone the smartphone isn't that lovely so who else can monitor what's in the refrigerator? Hmm? So what happens if they want to find out if you ate your fruits and vegetables today? The fruits and vegetables with the vaccine. They'll know. They'll know. Conveniences, the death of liberty. We're developing through technology an ability for consumers to measure their own carbon footprint. What does that mean? That's where are they traveling? How are they traveling? What are they eating? What are they consuming on the platform? So individual carbon footprint tracker. Mm. Stay tuned. We don't have it operational yet, but this is something that we're working on. Do you believe him? I don't believe him. It's already here, but yet to be rolled out. Okay. Okay. Cars subscription by 2030. Follow me here. All right. And the point I want to drive home is this. Do you know that they have now what is called uh, subscribing to camping equipments? Remember, they don't want us living weird in the country. So they want to control all your uh, outdoor goods and outdoor stores. And a time is going to come if we don't get these items now, we might not get them then. They might be way too expensive then. Or to access them, it has to be by subscription. Watch this. I'm going to move past the cars. Okay? Let me get by the cars. That ride hailing is... Close. So I really don't own any movies. I subscribe to Netflix. I don't as well. And we can see something like Uber as an example. 
Maybe you subscribe to clothes and clothes come to you, you wear them once, they're taken away, they're recycled and clean and then they're given to someone else. Look at the surveillance. Service. So imagine instead of having a washing machine, it's a smart washing machine. It knows how often you're using it. When you run out of detergent, detergent simply shows up in the mail. It knows that you just had a child, so you're gonna be using it more often. It's actually so adjusts if, to your needs. If the detergent can simply show up at your door, then can the detergent one day not show up at your door? And so these manufacturers are realizing we're in like 70% of the households in the U.S. And we should be able to collect information about people and understand what? what do they do? How often do they eat? Information on how people. Here it is now. If we can imagine clothes, why not furniture? Listen. Why not toys? Toys are used for a short time by kids as they grow up and maybe they could be subscribed to instead of being purchased. Listen. What about tools or kitchen stuff that you only use occasionally? The turkey roaster that you could summon on Thanksgiving, have delivered to your house within an hour. You use, give it back, they clean it, they store it, and they'll be ready to deliver it to you whenever you need it again. Camping. Camping equipment. Everybody wants the latest and the greatest high-tech this year's most sophisticated camping technology. Why would you buy camping equipment when you only use it occasionally and you could subscribe to the best instead? So we can kind of multiply this again and again to this vision. Do you see it? Where we A life via subscription is slavery. Tell us, Malcolm Roberts, it's slavery. The World Economic Forum is meant to be dismissed as a so-called conspiracy theory. If that's the case, why is the federal Liberal Party copying its policies? Scott Morrison's so-called trusted digital identity bill is a copy-paste directly from the World Economic Forum's Global Digital Identity Project. It's designed to shift the global economy away from private ownership into what the World Economic Forum calls an access model, where you own nothing and instead rent goods and services from the world's billionaires and billionaire corporations. In other words, the goal of digital identity is a life via subscription. Without assets and ownership, Australians will have no power over government, nor any power over the corporations that want to control people's lives. In their eyes, this will help the world live sustainably. But in reality, it's a form of slavery to a closed loop economy where you have less and the rich have more, way more. All right, friends, kings and queens. Anybody that's got a couple of acres of land and his own water supply and can grow his own food, these people are a threat to the collectivist society because they aren't going to go to the politicians and say, please feed me, please clothe me, please give me shelter. That's the secret behind Agenda 21. They want people out of the country. They want corporations out there growing all the food and that kind of thing, but they don't want anybody living out there. He mentioned four of the five keys. I covered those this morning. G. Edward Griffin, Agenda 21. Fathers and mothers who possess a piece of land and a comfortable home are what and what, friends, read with me, are kings and what? Queens. That's it. And I want some young people to understand this because young people, when you fellowship with certain other of your peers, they will think you are crazy. And that's why we need to educate each other. Parents, educate your children. Because you do not know who they will associate with. And the devil can sow seeds in the minds of your children. Yes. Destroy their minds. No more relish for spiritual things. And you find yourself like a lot running to the mountains but your children remain in Sodom and sin. In Germany, those who want to live on the countryside are labeled extremists because it's an agenda, a satanic agenda, Agenda 21, Agenda 2030. Get your smartphones now. That sounds weird, huh? Get your smartphones now. Let's go to Revelation 9. 
Where are we going to? Revelation 9. If we don't get out now, a time is going to come we won't be able to move. We won't be able to move. And not everybody has resources. So what is that fifth key of the five keys for survival? What? Fifth key? Assisting others. And that's what Sister White says. How do we assist the unemployed, the homeless? How? Don't look to the government. The government cannot solve pauperism. That means in the last days, many are going to be government paupers. They can't help you. She says, assist families to move out into the country and watch God work miracles. Revelation 9. Today I'm going to be addressing the sixth trumpet and the second woe. I want to make sure that Safe to Serve local, Safe to Serve international are not people who are, are people who are intelligent as it relates to the signs of the last days and the work of preparation. Because there is a group and that group is increasing and people are aware of many of the things going on around them. And they are getting ready. Look at verse 12 of Revelation chapter 9. One woe is past. That's the first woe. Sixth trumpet. And behold, there come two woes more after. Let's take a look at question number one. A quick reiteration from last class. And we're looking at these double charts. Chart on the left, 1843 chart. Chart on the right, 1850 chart. On both charts, you find Revelation 8 and 9, 5th trumpet, 6th trumpet, 7th trumpet, 1st woe, 2nd woe, and 3rd woe. Question 1. The blowing of the 4th trumpet against Rome represented which barbaric tribe? You have four options. Option A, the Huns. Option B, Heruli. Option C, the Visigoths. Option D, the Vandals. You have 30 seconds, and please place your answer not in the comment section, but in the poll question section. The blowing of the fourth trumpet. We'll get to the sixth trumpet shortly. Against Rome represented which barbaric tribe? Huns, Heruli, the Goths, or the Vandals? Okay? I'm hoping that you go over your notes. The fifth trumpet and the sixth trumpet were understood by almost every Adventist, not SDA, Adventist leading up to October 22nd, 1844. It's these two prophecies, fifth trumpet, sixth trumpet, first woe, second woe, that confirmed a day for a year principle and proved October 22nd, 1844. The fulfillment of chapter 8 of Daniel and verse 14. These two prophecies, don't sleep on them. And the poor preacher, let's get the results here. Now, I mean, we should get 100% on these first questions. <laughs> Are we marking our Bibles? Are we marking our Bibles? 49%. Chose option B, Heruli. Who chose option B? That answer is correct. Question number two. In which year was the fourth trumpet blown against Rome? Which year was the fourth trumpet blown against Rome? Option A, 410 AD. Option B, 476 AD. Option C, 428 
AD. Option D, 434 AD. You have 30 seconds. I'm not going to confirm the answers because it's a, re, uh, a repetition, reiteration of what we covered last Sabbath, Sabbath before. Okay? So you should have your answers on your handouts. By the way, I'll post the handout for this lesson shortly. Which year? Fourth trumpet. Because once we get the year, then we know the time setting, the time period for the fifth trumpet, first woe. Sixth trumpet, second woe. Okay? All right. That's our purpose. Okay. Let's go. End the poll, preacher. End the poll. Let's get the results. So we have 70% uh, chose option B, 476 AD. Who chose option B, 476 AD? That answer is correct. Question number three. The Muslims were united under one king. Revelation 9 verse 11. Fifth trumpet territory, first woe territory. What year was this fulfilled? What year? Four options. Option A, 1298 AD. Option B, 1299 AD. Option C, 1260 AD. And option D, 1290 AD. Choose your answer prayerfully. 30 seconds. 30 seconds. And if you just mark your Bibles, my friends, and the more we go over the questions, the points will remain in the mind. Just mark the Bibles, please. Don't let me put on my Jamaican vernacular. Mark the Bible now. Just, just, come on. End the poll, preacher. You got five, four, three, two. End the poll. Let's get the results. What do we have? All right. So we have 54% chose option B, 1299 AD. Who chose option B, 1299 AD? That answer is correct. Move on. We're in the fifth trumpet first world territory still. Question four, what year did the fifth trumpet first world? Come to an end. What year? Fifth trumpet, first woe, come to an end. Four options. Option A, 1335 AD. Option B, 1517 AD. Option C, 1449 AD. And option D, 1773 AD. You have 30 seconds. And friends, I'm going to be up to the time management, because I want to crunch the remaining questions in our remaining time, okay? So, especially for the reiteration, first questions here, let's get this done quickly, okay? What year, fifth trumpet, first woe, came to an end? What year? Okay, what year? So once we clear out of the fifth trumpet, first woe territory, we can get right into sixth trumpet, Second world territory, very, very important, very, very significant to understand. All right, please do this Q&A at home. Do it at home with your sister, your brother, children, parents. Q&A, 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 Proverbs 22.6, Q&A, train, catechize, Q&A, end the poll, preacher. All right, what do we have? So we have 61% chose option C, 449 AD. Who chose option C? That answer is correct. All right. Now, last question for fifth trumpet first war territory. Which power was being attacked by the Muslims between 1299 and 1449, four options. Which power was being attacked by the Muslim power between 1299 and 1449? You have four options. Option A, Papal Rome. 
Option B, Greece. Option C, the Jews. Option D, pagan Rome. 30 seconds. 30 seconds. 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Which power was being attacked by the Muslims? We're talking about the, barbaric, the barbarians between that time period. Between that time period. All right. Which power? Papal Rome, Greece, the Jews, pagan Rome. All right. Okay. And the poor preacher. Thank you so much. Let's see what we have for the results. All right. So we have, we have 66% chose option A, paper Rome. That answer is, who chose option A? That answer is correct. Friends, do you, we have not even touched 80% in the first five questions. That's all reiteration. What's going to happen when I get to the sixth trumpet? Second wall. Okay, sixth trumpet territory. Let's go. Revelation 9. Let's take a look at verse 12 and verse 13. I'm going to read and then ask the question. Verse 12. One war is past, and behold, there come two wars more hereafter. Verse 13. The sixth angel sounded. And I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God. Question number six. A golden altar is seen when the sixth angel sounds. Where is this golden altar located? Four options. Outside the gate. Option B. Outer court, option C, holy place, option D, most holy place. You have 30 seconds, and 30 seconds to the, to, to the digit. This is the golden altar. There is nothing written here by happenstance. Everything is important. That's the location our minds, our eyes are drawn to. The voice from, from the golden altar is what announces the sixth trumpet, second woe. That's where our eyes should go. So where is it? Where is it? Where is it? All right, friends, let's go. End the poll. Where is it? What do we have? Okay. So we have 43% chose option C, the holy place. Who chose option C, holy place? That answer is, is correct. That is in the holy place, the altar, the altar of incense is where? In the holy place. Go with me, Exodus chapter 30, quickly, Exodus chapter 30, all right, notice here in verse 1, it mentions altar to burn incense, verse 3, it was made of pure gold, verse 3, it had the four horns on it, and where was this place? It was placed in verse 6. Before the veil, not within the veil, before the veil. That's the holy place, holy place. Question number seven, all right? That's where it was placed. That's very, very important. May I ask a question, friends? This should have been on your quiz, but I'll ask it nevertheless. What year did Christ move from the holy to the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. Everybody, let me hear you. October 22nd, what? Wonderful. Question. Does the sixth trumpet, this one here, second woe, occur before October 22nd, 1844? Or after 
October 22nd, don't shout, 1844, raise your hand. What do you say? What do you say? Let me come over here. What do you say? Somebody else. Raise your hand. What do you say? When? After? The answer is before. Bef I don't trick people. My, don't watch my face. In the last days, you cannot trust your senses. Sense of sight. Don't watch my face. Amen? Amen. Great controversy. Page 625. Come back here now. So that means the Bible opens up six trumpet, second woe. It says, look into this apartment, the altar of incense. That means it takes place before Christ moves to the most holy place, 1844. That's significant. Location gives you date. Make sense? Let's move on. Question number seven. Question seven. What is meant by, you know what, take your writing instrument. Go to your Bible, please. Mark your Bible. Go back to verse 13 and simply write the words before October 22nd, 1844. This event happens before October 22nd, 1844. Before October 22nd, 1844. Why? Christ moves into the most holy place, October 22nd, 1844. So second trumpet, first, second, sixth trumpet, slow it down, sixth trumpet, second woe, must occur before October 22nd, 1844. Location gives you the date. Question seven. What is meant by the following? Lose to four angels in Revelation 9. Look at verse 4, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, loose the four angels, which are bound in the great river Euphrates. Question, what is meant by the following? Loose the four angels. In chapter 9 and verse 14 of Revelation, you have four options. Option A, release angels from punishment. Option B, war and strife. Option C, send the angels on an errand. Option D, kick the angels out of heaven. You have 30 seconds. When you are through with this Q&A session, you should be able to understand the big picture going on. And the nitty gritty you can address when you get your hand out. Big picture, overview here, high level, okay? Loose the four angels, loose them, loose the four angels. Release, you have it there. This is important to understand. Okay, friends, and the poor preacher, let's get that. What do we have? Okay. All right. So we have 82%. Chose option B, war and strife. Who chose option B, war and strife? Was that an educated guess? Okay. Put your, put your hands back up. Who chose option, option, option B? Right here. Why did you choose option B? Right here. So the other options did not make sense. An educated guess. Let me come over here. Anybody? Why did you choose option B? Correct. Correct. So my sister is connecting. Scripture with scripture, loose the four angels is the opposite of hold the four angels. Look at Revelation 7. Look at verse 1. 
Look at verse 1. And after these things, I saw four angels standing where? You see, four and four corners. What are they doing? They are holding, not releasing. They are holding, not loosing. Holding the four winds of the earth. So when they are holding the winds, what happens? There is no destruction. Go to verse 4. Verse 3, verse 3. Saying, hurt not the earth. The holding means hurt not. So what is the release and the loosing? War and uh, strife. Next question, preacher. So put, come on, friends. So take your writing instrument. Go back to chapter 9. And where you see in verse 14, loose the four angels. What text will you now put there? Revelation 7, 1 through 3. Okay? All right. And when you do that, then you put Daniel 7, the winds. Daniel, what chapter did I say? Daniel 7, verse 2 and verse 3. Winds, destruction. And of course, last scripture, Job chapter 1. Job what chapter? Chapter 1 and verse 19. When winds are released, war, strife, destruction. And that's what's going on. That's why it's called six trumpet, second what? Whoa. W-O-E. Whoa. All right. Question number eight. Which of the following is one of the four nations that surround the great river Euphrates? Do not pull up Google and images. Don't do it. Four options. Option A, Rome. Option B, Turkey. Option C, Greece. Option D, Jerusalem. You have 30 seconds. All right, the scripture is verse 14 again. Six angel, which had the trumpet, loose the four angels, which are bound in the great river Euphrates. Hold nothing back anymore. Release. War. Strife. Trumpet. Means. Judgment is coming. Destruction. Not only a message, but destruction. So which of the following is one of the four nations that surround the great river Euphrates? Rome, Turkey, Greece, and Jerusalem. You have no more seconds. And the poor preacher, let's get the results here. What do we have? As I thought. So 56% chose option B, Turkey. Who chose option B? Don't watch my face. Option B, Turkey, anybody? Let me see the hands. No hands? No hands. That answer is uh, correct. Okay? So what are the other three? Begin to write. Come with me. Go to verse 14. Okay? What are the other three? You have Turkey. You have Iraq. You have Iran. You have Syria. But in this time period, we're talking about the major city in each of the four. The major city in each of the four countries that surround the great river Euphrates, right? On your handout that you will receive, you'll see what those cities were. I'm giving you high level right now, big picture, Iraq, Iran, Syria, and Turkey. Make sense? Next question. Number nine, ready preacher? Ready? So put, put all four right there by verse 14. Verse what? 14. Everybody, skip, down, skip on down to verse 16 with me as I set this up for question 9, verse 16. Ready, friends? And the number of the what? The army of the horsemen. Sixth trumpet, second war is about what? Horsemen, war and strife. Does it make sense now, friends? 
So the loosing of the four angels represent wars. Armies fighting. It confirms it. Not hold back the four. No, release them. Wars, armies. Wonderful. Okay, question nine. Question. And that's why I began with Jeremiah 12, verse 5. If you cannot keep up with the footmen, how will you contend with the horses? And if you're weary by the horses, how are you going to endure the swelling of the Jordan? Question nine. What is the primary religion of the four nations that surround the great river Euphrates? You have four options. Option A, Christianity. Option B, Islam. Option C, Judaism. Option D, Catholicism. And never you make the mistake as a Bible student and call Catholicism Christianity. It's not a Christian religion. It's a pagan religion, masking as a Christian religion. All right? You have 30 seconds. Which is the primary religion of the four nations that surround the great river Euphrates? Christianity, Islam, Judaism, Catholicism. You have 30 seconds. Make your calling election sure, prayerfully. Which, which? All right, which one? Which of the four? Look at your own phone. Isn't it in interesting? Your phone is always private. Only your eyes look at your phone, except when you come for Q&A. <laughs> End the poll. End the poll. All of a sudden, you're kind with your phone. End the poll, preacher. Let's see what we have here. Okay. So we have 85%. If I was going to get 100 today, this should have been it. 85% chose Islam. That's okay. I'll keep working with it. Who chose Islam? That is correct. Turkey? Islam. Iran? Islam. Iraq? Islam. Syria? Islam. Sixth trumpet? Second war? What power? Islam. Okay. Fifth trumpet? First war? What religion? Islam. Wonderful. Let's move on, friends. Question 10. How? Oh, okay. Let's go to verse number 15 of chapter 9 of Revelation. And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour, a day, a month, and a year, not to pacify men, but to slay men. That's the loosing of the angels. Not hold back anything, destroy everything. All right. Question 10, how many years and days does the following prophecy represent? One hour, one day, one month, one year. You have four options. Option A, 391 years, 15 days. Option B, 320 years, 14 days. Option C, 400 years, 13 days. Option D, 451 years, 12 days. You have 30 seconds. 30 seconds. How many years and days does this prophecy represent? An hour, a day, a month, a year. And there are your four options. This prophecy is what set the stage for the Advent believers. These are the, the progenitors of the Seventh-day Adventist movement. This prophecy. Yes, this prophecy. These prophecies, fifth trumpet, first war, sixth trumpet, second war, lay the foundation to confirm day for a year principle. All right. That looks like it. I'll give you five more seconds just to make sure. Nobody cries. You didn't give me enough time. 
I'm hoping for over 90% on this one. Will I get it? Don't be pessimistic. End the poll. Let's go. All right, where are we now? So we have 56% chose option A, 391 years and 15 days. Who chose option A? A? Option A? Option A? That answer is correct. Okay, break it down. Let's go. Let's begin with the one year. How many days can put down one year if you can mark the Bible or write first on a paper, then transfer? How many days comprise one biblical year? How many days? 360 days comprise one biblical year, but it's prophetic. So 360 days become how many years? 360 years. So put down 360. Let's go to the one month. Ready? How many days comprise one biblical month? 30. Let's add it now. So 30 plus 60. How many years do you have now? 390 years. Okay. We have one day. What does a day typify in prophecy? One year. So how many years do we have now, everybody? 390 and one year. 391 years. Then we come to one hour. So how many days are represented by one prophetic hour? 15. How do we get 15? How many hours are in one day? 24. So, put, uh, so we divide 360 by 24. 360 days in one year. 24 hours in one day. One day to how many days in the year? So 24, 360 over 24 is what? 15. So it's 391 years and 15 days. That's your prophecy right there. Let me do a peep if that comes next. Yes, it comes next. May I move on now? Question number 10. Number 11. What was the starting date for the 391 years and 15 days? Six trumpet? Second row, you have four options. The starting date. All right. Option A, October 31st, 1517. Option B, February 20th, 1798. Option C, November 1st, 1755. Option D, July 27th, 1449. I'm going to give you 45 seconds for this one. The starting date for the 391 years and 15 days. So once we find the prophecy, how many literal years it represents, we must find the starting date now. Six trumpet, second row, Muslims, terrorizing mankind, just as the media said after September 11th, blame radical Islamic terrorists for the destruction of the Twin Towers in New York City. Something similar happened back there. So give us now the starting date for that prophecy. 391 years and 15 days. Six trumpet, second woe. Woe, woe. Release the winds. All right, friends. High level. End the poll, preacher. End the poll. I can feel it in my bones. I don't have 90% and above. I can feel it. I'm correct. 49% chose option D. 
July 27th, 1449. Who chose that answer? Okay. Okay. Let me see the hands. Please. Wonderful. Hands down. That answer is correct. And we covered that last class. And I gave you a handout. Okay. With that in mind, let's move on. Question number 12. Elder, preacher man, ready? Question 12. What was the ending date for the 391 years and 15 days? Six trumpet, second woe. Since we have the starting, find the ending date. Four options. Option A, November 1st, 1755. Option B, August 11th, 1840. Option C, May 19, 1780. Option D, September 11th, 2001. 30 seconds. If you get this one incorrect, I'm going to take a seat. This one is for a easy dunk. Go ahead. Nail in a sure place. Let's go, friends. Let's go. Listen to me. If the world was watching this this evening, and the world, a non-SDA, saw question 11 and heard the answer and then comes question 12 and look at the results what would they say the jury is still out let's bring in the jurors make sense and the poll preacher let's see what the verdict is going to be What do we have? 53. That's five and three. Can you imagine that? Five, three. Fifty-three percent chose option B, August 11th, 1840. Who chose option B? August, let me see all the hands in the church. You know, you know hands down, hands down. Who did not choose option B? Raise your hand. You have to see me afterwards. Please, I want to pray with you. Lay hands on you. In prayer, amen? August 11th, 1840. That's all right. You will not forget it now, amen? We make the mistakes here, but not tomorrow. Next week, next month, make it now. And right the wrongs now. That's why we do this, friends. None of us. Knew this at first. We had to learn it. So don't feel pressed down or dismayed. Okay, uh, get your smartphone. So how did you arrive at 1840? Raise your hand, talk to me. How did you arrive at 1840? I want to break this down. One or two persons or three over here? My sister, how did you arrive at 1840? I don't want to call your name. Your sister. Let's go. You read the book? Okay, ask your sister. Come on, sis. So fourteen four to nine plus three hundred and ninety one equals eighteen forty. Thank you. I'm gonna to come to my right. How did you arrive at August eleventh? From okay, go ahead. August eleventh. Okay, get your smartphone. Pull up your calendar and look for August, look for July 27th. And count 15 days, raise your hand and tell me what date you get. Pull up your smartphone, go to the calendar, find, all, find July 27th, count 15. What 
month, and what day do you have? Raise your hand. Count, count 15 days forward from July 27. Count 15. Go ahead, sister. What do you have? <laughs> count 15. August 11. One day. Count it. 15, August 11, 1840. Okay, friends. What happened August 11, 1840? Okay. Could you get a microphone and talk to us? What happened August 11th, 1840? These two preachers did the Sabbath school several months back. So reiterate for us, Evangelist Ryan, what happened August 11th, 1840? That was so significant. The fall of the Ottoman Empire. The fall of the Ottoman Empire. Ottoman, what religion is this we're talking about? And what is, nation? Is, is, is Islamic religion. Islam, what, what, what nation of the four? Because we had Turkey, we had uh, Iraq, we had Iran, and we had Syria, and the main cities of the four. So which of the four nations specifically fell August 11th, 1840. Turkey. 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 Your handout is going to confirm that. It's Turkey. Turkey. All right. August 11th, 1840, when Turkey surrendered her powers to the Christian powers of the West. Turkey. August 11th, 1840. Imagine now what the pioneers of the SDA movement thought. And who, but, oh, I should, who was the, the Adventist that prophesied August 11th, 1840 to the date before it happened? Raise your hand. I should have put that on the screen. His name. Put your hand down, Hillary. His name. I'm going to come back to you, my sister. Josiah Leach. Thank you so much. Josiah. Josiah. If you can recall and remember Josiah in the Bible, and in some way, somehow, remember Lich. I can't help you with Lich, but I can help you with Josiah. Josiah Lich. He took this prophecy, listen, of Revelation 9, months before August 11th, 1840, and said, listen, Turkey is going to fall. Based on this prophecy, day for a year, one literal day represents one year. And he wrote it, and when August 1st, 1840 came, he actually said, listen, I'm going to be more specific. It will fall August 11th, 1840. And everybody sat there anxiously awaiting this event. And just as he prophesied it, it came to pass. Same day. So what were the Adventists not believing? What about the bigger prophecy? Daniel 8, 14, 2,300 days. These are years. 457 BC. Go now, 2,300 years. It comes to 1844. Tenth day. Seventh month, October 22nd, Christ will move to the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. But they thought he would return. Watch the point. Did any one of us see Christ move from the holy to the most holy place in the heavenly sanctuary? No. So what has he given to us to believe it? So since this one came to pass, Day for year, exact date, you have to believe the others. He gives us things known so we can believe the unknown. Do you remember what he said to Thomas? Thomas, because you have seen, you believe. But blessed are those who have not seen, but what? He gives the prophet. That's why the fifth trumpet first woe, the 
The starting date, ending date is so important. Six trumpets, second woe, starting date, end, it's so important. It confirms the 2300 day prophecy. And that's why I can never, by God's grace, leave the Seventh day Adventist church. Can't. Where am I going? I don't see how people leave this church movement and join some other denomination. Makes no sense. By God's grace, I can never walk away from this truth. And even though I haven't seen him go, I believe he went because of these prophecies. And listen to me. This is how we can take our Bibles and actually convince an atheist, persuade an atheist. It's the prophecies being fulfilled that will persuade atheists. You take this to a Muslim and say, compare your Quran with this. It's the Bible that's inspired. The Quran has no prophecy. Take Hinduism, take your Gita, Hindu uh, sacred text, void of prophecy. And its fulfillment, the Bible has it. Do you see my point, friends? And that's how we can convert the world. Fifth trumpet, sixth trumpet. So when you speak to your children and they ask, what's the big deal? Now you can explain what the big deal is. Where Christ is, it proves the Bible is inspired. Makes sense? Makes sense. So since he went to the most holy place, will he come out? So all the other prophecies, will they come to pass also? Yes. Because what, what, what was prophesied came to pass, what is still to come to pass shall come to pass. Amen, friends? And that's why we are Seventh-day Adventists. And that's why the foundation of our movement is the sanctuary message. It's our central pillar. It's our foundation. The prophecies confirm that. I think that's it. Let me give you one last one. Question 13. Friends, when you get your handout, please go over it. Please reread the handout. I want to read this for you. We're told, what's that? Page 333. We're told in the book Great Controversy that when the prophecy came to pass, everybody, allow me to read this in your hearing. Page 334. It says, in the year 1840, another remarkable fulfillment of prophecy excited widespread interest. Listen to this. Two years before Josiah Litch, one of the leading ministers who was preaching the second advent, published an article on Revelation 9, predicting the fall of the Ottoman Empire. According to his calculations, Mr. Litch, Brother Litch, this power was to be overthrown in A.D. 1840. Sometime in the month of August, he wrote first. And then he gives the calculation. But watch now. He says, it will end the 11th of August, 1840, when the Ottoman Power in Constantinople may be expected to be broken, and this, I believe, will be found to be the case, end quote. Sister White writes now, at the very time specified, Turkey, through her ambassadors, accepted the protection of the allied powers of Europe and thus placed herself under the control of Christian nations. The event exactly fulfilled the prediction. What happened afterwards? When it became known, multitudes were convinced of the correctness of the principles of prophetic interpretation. Prophetic interpretation adopted by William Miller 
and his associates. And a wonderful impetus. What is impetus? A wonderful force, aggression, expedition was given to the Advent movement. Watch this now. Men of learning, men of position, united with William Miller. So what caused men of learning, great men of position, to now join the Advent movement? The fulfillment of what? So what are we to preach now? But the preachers, even some of them, so-called in self-supporting ministry, independent lines tell you, don't focus so often on end-time prophecies. What caused men of learning and high position to join the Advent movement, both in preaching and in publishing his views? And from 1840 to 1844, four words, the work rapidly progressed. And that was the opening of the investigative judgment. The American reformer. The American reformer is the chapter. From 1840 to 1844, the work rapidly progressed. Now watch the connection, application. 1840, a prophecy was fulfilled. Four years, the movement moved rapidly to October 22nd, 1844. That was when Christ began the work of investigative judgment, end time application. So before Christ closes the work of investigation, what must be fulfilling? What must we be showing the people? Prophecies being fulfilled. And thus the work, the work will rapidly go forward so Christ can stand up. Simple application. Let me close. Question third, once we get the point of these two trumpets and woes, I can close. Question 13, on to the sixth trumpet, second woe. I have no time for that. Amen. You know what? Let me test you. Let me, let me test you. Do you have a preacher? Okay, post it. On to the sixth trumpet, second woe. Tales are used to hurt men. What do the tales represent. I'm hoping to get my 90% now. You have four options. Tails, poison, B, weapons, C, false prophets, D, the end, the conclusion. And that's our last question, end and conclusion. You have 30 seconds, friends. Let's pray. 30 seconds. I'm waiting for this one. Please don't let the Lord down. Over 90%. Come on, friends, give it to me. Send me off to a peaceful rest tonight, amen? As I lay on my bed tonight, reflecting on the Sabbath, have I done thy will, O Lord? Let me look and see 90%. Above 90. Amen, friends? I'm going to give you 10 extra... Extra, extra seconds. Ten extra seconds just to make sure I'm working for my, my bonus. My bonus, I'm working for it. 90%. All right, preacher, the time has come. Time is finished. It is done. And the poor preacher, I can feel something in my bones. 80, that's 8 and 0. 80 percent chose option C, false prophets. Who chose option C? That answer is correct. What text say tale, false prophet? Isaiah, thank you. Chapter 9 and verse 15. All right, friends. Once you get your handout, go over the handout. And I told the preachers back there, these prophetic studies have to be cyclical and we may need to kind of alter Sabbath school so we can make sure what is being taught is lodging and remaining in our minds. The time will come, we will have to give 
the declaration of what we believe. Do you know every 99.99 .99 of the young people and the adults leading up to 1840 understood this prophecy? 1844 understood the fifth trumpet, first war, sixth trumpet, second war. They understood it. What about our people? We need to understand these prophecies. So we have to start somewhere. Don't become discouraged. Just so put in the work. As you add, God will multiply. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we're thankful for our time spent in your presence. Thank you for the revelation of thy will. Thank you for the sure word of prophecy that confirms the God of creation, the Bible is inspired, and you, you have a true church, a body of faithful believers. You have given the message, the oracles to give to the world. While we impart, may the blessings convert us. Bless your people. Bless them with mental stamina, mental endurance as they read, as they study, that they will retain. And one best way to retain is by them sharing. Father, seal us. The sealing is both intellectually and spiritually so we cannot be moved. That's the experience we need, intellectualism and practical godliness. Prepare us now for this new week. The sun has set. We lay all our plans in your hands, knowing that we are going to meet giants, but we meet them in the name of the Lord. We have our sling, which is to throw, and we will throw the it is written. Throw the it is written. Five times. Throw, throw, throw the it is written. At temptations, the giants, so we can be conquerors, overcomers through Jesus Christ. We thank you for your love and your mercies. Bring us back at the appointed time. Remember those who are sick in need of healing. Your promise is you will never allow the Sabbath to pass. You will grant us the blessings. Those who are going through bereavement, those who need directions, as the sun set, for many people, the burdens return. What they have to face this new week. Help us to remember the battle is not ours. The battle is the Lord's. And victory is ours because he has a thousand ways to provide of which we know nothing. So why doubt? Just pray and believe, do our part, and leave the rest with you. We thank you for hearing. We thank you for answering. Is our prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. And the church said, Amen. Amen. Amen.